Hi. We're going to touch on an incredibly important topic. Uh, I may have already said that regenerative agriculture, imagine if all agribusiness had to go organic because the people demanded it. Um, if, if all agriculture were to go organic, we would stabilize local economies because all the agriculture would have to go local with uh, small farmers coming back to their fields and um, at going through whatever process is necessary to let the genetically modified seed and plants die out, which they're designed to do, so it shouldn't be too difficult to go to regenerative agriculture. And I've learned so much about it this last year. Um, it just blew me away, and I, I'm sure it will you also. Um, it's a, a privilege to share this good news, because if if we go this route of demanding that agriculture uh, become organic, healthy, then we will be able to reverse climate change. And I'll talk to you about how that happens with regenerative agriculture, what the scientists are beginning to say. Such good news that by, by going local and organic and getting those plant-derived minerals into our bodies and the, the microbiological life from the plants that help transfer vitamins and minerals into our body. So that as uh, one famous doctor says, we're not just urinating very expensive urine. Uh, I mean, uh, the benefits are so incredible because with a healthier food intake, with local farms coming back to life, with organic produce which has to be produced locally, there will also be millions of jobs created basically overnight because organic farms require human care. You can't just stick a machine out there to scare away the, the insects. You, instead of eliminating insects in organic agriculture, you simply control uh, them, keep them away from these plants and direct them to those or whatever, the sacrificial plants. Um, but millions of jobs would be created as organic farms grew up all around the, the world, actually. It's, uh, there's a movement, uh, as I understand it, uh, the demand for organic produce is at about a 10% per annum increase. 10% every year more demand. I don't know if that where that came from, that statistic, but I, I read it somewhere. I know that, um, just for your information, uh, uh, Sid, uh, Sid's market over in Taos says that they are only getting 1% of their organic produce from New Mexico. They, they, they could buy all that we can produce. So there's a huge market out there for this healthy, um, way of returning to the true agriculture, regenerative, alive, life-giving agriculture. Um, uh, the fact that millions of farmers uh, throughout Central America and Mexico have had to leave their fields because the seed wouldn't grow. It, it was a genetically modified seed requiring a whole package of chemicals from companies like Monsanto have destroyed the agriculture of Guatemala, 
Honduras, Mexico. Me Mexico used to be the greatest exporter of regenerative corn that you could re, re, you know, take some of the best seed and plant it for next year. Now, it's the biggest importer in the world of transgenic corn from our prairie lands here, Kansas and places like that with heavily subsidized agriculture. In other words, our tax money is going to the destruction of the soil which in which plants are grown now through chemical support uh, and lack completely the plant-derived minerals and vitamins that are necessary for a healthy plant which resists insects uh, and also which drives away certain weeds when the plants are healthy. You know, it's just a, a beautiful cosmology. And I want to take you here on a little exploration of one of the most amazing inventions that can make this happen. And it's a, a certain type of a plow that doesn't turn the soil over. Because when you turn soil over, any life that's in there is killed by uh, UV light from the sun. This uh, topic of regenerative agriculture, um, I'm, I'm going to be putting under A for, for ag, and let's call it 1.1, this particular uh, video tonight. Um, it, it, I, I um, decided that it was super important to put in into the great mandate. Um, a demand which became the 26th of 33 um, that we the people of the United States of America demand that all agriculture be regenerative, organic. Um, and the rest of the mandate is that um, the agribusiness corporations, which some, are some of the most uh, wealthy in the world, um, help to regenerate all the soil that they destroyed around the world and help small farmers um, revitalize, regenerate their fields. Um, they hear some of the benefits of, of uh, a demand like this. Um, we would be having plant-derived minerals and vitamins and microorganisms which only grow in organic soil. And remember, the microorganisms uh, transfer in our digestive system vitamins and minerals to our bodies. Um, there would be renewable energy trucking. Uh, in other words, trucks that use biofuel or, or, or electric, and solar powered. Um, it would bring an end to the immigration problem. Uh, chemical agriculture is driving millions off of farms and trying to feed their families. They come to the USA, to El Norte. Um, the key line plow is helping to bring about an agricultural revolution. The key line plow is now known around the world. It's in uh, Española area. We have um, this type of plow that just pulls these blades through the earth to bring oxygen and water down to uh, as far down as you can get with your blades, you know, maybe as much as two or three feet. Um, it um, is an amazing invention from Australia. The reason why it's called key line is that when you run the first pass of your tractor pulling those blades behind you, you want to be perpendicular to water flow. 
And what that does is it spreads the water out throughout the field. And, and now, with this plow, deep into the key line cuts. We have, now have water and oxygen way down in here where uh, there are seeds waiting even hundreds of years for, for uh, water and oxygen. They, they just burst alive. And, and, and what happens is that plant growth absorbs carbon. Uh, the carbon is used to grow tissue for carbon capturing machines. Plants. And so scientists now believe that dead soil uh, to be the number one cause of climate change. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this one out. Sorry about that little bump in the road. We all know where India is. Now this is where the Green Revolution started. <laughs> It, amazing, no? They called it the Green Revolution, and it was the introduction of GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and transgenic genic agriculture. Um, it, it, the introduction of end of life seeds, you know, termination genes, etc. Uh, is it, and, and, and as you know, oh God, it's just even hard to, thousands, thousands of farmers have committed suicide because they, they can't feed their families anymore. Um, this, again, big agribusiness is taking over and, um, a scientist told his group of people, listeners, that um, if, if, if only 1%, if only 1% of India's arable land were, were regenerated to, to, to bring life, back, you know, into the soil, into the root system, and into the plant life and the tissue. Um, the, if, if only 1% of India's arable land, I'll just put here, of arable land, um, were to be regenerated, then it would then it could absorb all the CO two emitted by humans. Isn't that amazing? A statistic. Now, I I, I have some. Friends of mine who, hearing me say what I just re repeated to you, which came from a scientist at the Kuvira conference in Albuquerque a couple of years ago, um, is, said that it had to be a, a mistake. <laughs> um, that would not be possible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, understanding how regenerated soil, you know, with lots of uh, microbes, uh, absorbs CO2. Um, it, transfers the carbon into the, the tissue of a plant.
right? And then that absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. And this same scientist said, and I believe he was referring to one season, one farming, one, one farming season, that one cubic foot of earth could absorb a ton of carbon if it were alive. Now, I don't know, I, I don't know enough information about exactly what kind of experiment was done or how they know that it can uh, absorb that much carbon. And uh, the only uh, revelation I have about this is the fact that it's not just stored in the, it, it, it collects that much, but it isn't stored in the ground. It actually is transferred to the tissue of a plant, uh, right? The carbon goes into the tissue of this plant, which then, is able to absorb even more. I, I um, it, it's, it's not a matter of storing it, but processing it, um, and taking it out of the atmosphere, taking out a ton. A ton. I can believe that, um, and I, I think, uh, being a scientist, uh, well, it's not easy to contradict them. Uh, so, isn't that amazing? Here we're talking about how. Um, regenerative agriculture uh, considered by the way um, a seed not being able to reproduce many believe you know that that's a sin against God hmm. let's let me go back to my previous page oh no Anyway, I think I'm uh, I'm going well here. Um, oh, 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 I there's a statistic that I didn't put here. Maybe I'll I'll um, put it right here. Sorry about that. Um, this uh, these scientists at the Kivira. Uh, conference in Albuquerque um, said also that 18 inches <laughs> it's hard to believe uh, here let me get this out of the way okay 18 inches of topsoil created Using the key line plow, okay, I'll just put here key line plow. Got it? Two years. 18 inches of topsoil. Um... This is just remarkable. Um, check out it, what in Portuguese is terra preta, and it means uh, black soil. And look into this because it, it's fascinating that um, the civilization uh, in the Amazon before the arrival of the disease through trade with uh, the Spanish up in Central America, I mean, the, the disease wiped out. Uh, a, according to Gavin, um, possibly 200 million or more indigenous people the ones living in the Amazon over the years uh, had a meter deep uh, carbon from their fires, um, sheltering billions, okay, I mean billions of microorganisms per cub cubic centimeter. 
<laughs> billions. Um, and so they were able to take that really drenched, depleted soil of the Amazon from all the rain and stuff and create a suitable uh, top soil level with kitchen scraps and carbon and all of that accumulating a, a meter deep in many places, right? Uh, the possibility of growing fruit trees. And so for perhaps thousands of years, uh, the Teja Preta became the basis for an orchard. <laughs> Well, many orchards, I should say, wherever there were these this type of settlement. And uh, when disease swept through uh, from the north, the orchards got away from them. And and because of their rich uh, biomass, uh, they, they were able, able to move away from even the settled communities with time and with the bird droppings and life happening as it went expanding and it became the Amazon uh, of today. I used to live in a mango tree. Uh, I, I lived in Brazil. I was born and raised in Brazil. And so I'm really interested in Teja Preta. And I want you to know that um, uh, Northern New Mexico College will be putting some biochar into my farm, the Dunsmore Farm over here in Vallecito. So there'll be an experiment on going there with how, how biochar, which is basically charcoal, um, can improve our soil and at the same time heat the part of the El Rito campus and also provide electricity. Um, back to the, uh, the great mandate, I just wanted to say that um, when you think of all the different benefits uh, of, of actually reversing climate change, and I put that one in here, <laughs> <clears throat> I have a much more nutrition nutritious um, food and consequently people F full of of life and good nutrition uh, let's put here health healthy people um, getting their minerals and vitamins